so much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is the Mr. Media Interview, sponsored by the audiobook edition of Will Eisner, A Spirited Life, now available on iTunes and audible.com, and recorded live on blogtalkradio.com from the new media and American League Baseball capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. I wouldn't mind spending a day or two in the shoes of Mike Sachs. I'm assuming that they're comfortable anyway. Uh, During the day, and probably quite a few nights, he's a mild-mannered staff writer for Vanity Fair magazine. And when he's not doing that, of late, he's been interviewing some of the smartest, funniest writers around for his new book, And Here's the Kicker, Conversations with 21 Top Humor Writers on Their Craft. As a writer myself, this book was irresistible to me. The chance to eavesdrop on Sachs' Q&A with the guys behind everything, and some girls, one girl, behind everything from The Office, Borat, Saturday Night Live, to Mad Magazine, The Onion, and MASH. Even if you're not a writer, this is a rich, va- rich vein, well, I can't talk, this is a rich vein to mine for laughs and insights into your favorite pop culture landmarks. Now, Mike? Let's turn it on. Mike, welcome to Mr. Media. Thanks for having me. I should say that there's more than one woman interviewed. Uh, uh, what did I miss? It's, uh, oh, uh, Alison Silverman. Is right, and Meryl Marco. Meryl and actually, Marco. there was a few that unfortunately got cut. Oh, you bastard. How could you do that to them? Oh, I, I have so many <laughs> stories about this publisher. <laughs> oh, you mean Writer's Digest Books is not a good publisher for writers? What a shock. <laughs> Isn't that a shock? <laughs> yes, indeed. I'm going to just shut my mouth right now. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. You and I can talk off the air and trade book publisher stories. I guarantee you, I guarantee you that I will win. <laughs> Have you dealt with them in particular? Not them. Nope. Okay. Not, not them, but uh, plenty of other reputable yeah. publishers who have just as bad stories to tell. Well, it's even more ironic that those who deal in the uh, advice to get published sometimes don't know the best way to go about that. <laughs> no, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I, here's all I'm going to say on this for anyone listening or you if you want to check this out while we're talking. Go to Amazon.com and search the title CNBC Profit Drivers and then we'll talk. <laughs> Meanwhile, um, this was such a fun idea for a book. I, I, I am not through it yet. I'm going to admit I'm not through it because I'm reading it. I'm not, I'm not scanning or zipping through it. I'm reading it like word for word. Oh, great. It, it's just, you know, for me, it's just, it's just wonderful. How did this come about? Well, it was actually a few years in the making, um, and uh, it was rejected everywhere. I, I had started sending this out, I guess, about three years ago to various publishers, and no one was interested they thought that no one would want to buy a book like this necessarily. Um, Idiots. I know. But see, <laughs> I, there was nothing out there that I... I love interview books, and I love reading about uh, humor, and there was no interview books with contemporary humor writers. There was quite a few with uh, SNL writers or your show, your show of show writers, but surprisingly none with uh, those who will be influential on those just coming up now. You know, the big names, Robert Smigel, George Meyer... Davis Sedaris and all that. But it was only because of a friend of mine, uh, John Warner, who at that time was working as an editor at McSweeney's uh, dot, you know, online, mm-hmm. that he had uh, he was working with Writer's Digest Press on a humor imprint, and uh, he pushed it through. And luckily, all I needed to do was just a one-page synopsis, which was great. Mm. Because usually when you pitch a book, you have to send at least one chapter in or whatever. But this one was very right. simple and went through, and that was that. Wow. And, and for those who don't know, would you care to explain what the kicker in the title, and here's the kicker, is? Well, th- that's a ter- you've heard the term, haven't you, and here's the kicker? I have. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, here's, I, I don't even know if it's, uh, is it still used? It was just something that I knew about. I think the newspapers still use it, but I don't think it's the same, uh, I'm assuming that it's not the same context that you're using it. No, the context I'm using it in is uh, basically, and here's the uh, punchline, here's the juice. Right. You know, this is... This is what it all boils down to. Uh, I and I know from experience, uh, from doing uh, newspaper and magazine interviews with them, and and having uh, funny people on on this show, um, that writers who are hysterically funny on paper don't necessarily socialize well 
or make the best conversationalists. And I wondered if that was true among your interview subjects. Well, not only do they, I mean, most of them don't, if not all of them. And that, I think that's one of the reasons why they are who they are, why they're writers and not performers. Hmm. Um, it is interesting. A lot of them are very, very shy and socially awkward. But um, they do tend to open up. And a lot of these writers that I talked with, I talked for up to 10 hours, not consecutively, just over a period hmm. of time. And, you know, they get used to you and they know that you did your research and they'll eventually open up. But, you know, if I just saw them or met them at a party, it would have been a car wreck. It would have been a mm-hmm. disaster. How how, uh, how did you, how many of them did, that are in this book did you know and how many did you have to, uh, you know, uh, have somebody help open a door to them? Oh, I didn't know any of them really. Yet. Okay. Um, and that's what's so great about them giving me their time. They didn't know who I was necessarily. I mean, they know I work at Vanity Fair, but they weren't familiar with my writing or who I was. Um, and, you know, they just they gave themselves over uh, and their time to me. It's a big trust factor. Um, you know, so I had a really, it, that was a lot of, a lot of the book was just logistics, finding where these people were and uh, how to get in contact with them. And I found that the older generation, Larry Gelbart, Dick Cavett, Al Jaffe of Mad Magazine, Irving Brecker, they were much easier to get a hold of. There was no assistance between me and them. There was no staff. Mm. They would usually just write back by email within, you know, the day. Or you know, In the case of Larry Gelbart, within five minutes, he just got back to me himself. Whereas some of the younger writers out in Hollywood, it would take sometimes months to set up an interview. <laughs> um, the, I, I, one of the... What was I going to say? It, it was... It was Really interesting. There's been a lot written, and you mentioned uh, Saturday Night Live. There's been a lot written, particularly about the early days. I mean, it was very interesting to hear directly in his own words from Buck Henry, but his and his insights into um, The Graduate and uh, Catch-22, really great stuff. Oh, thanks. Yeah, he, he's, he's the type of person who, no matter what you ask him, and I asked him some questions that he might not have been happy to answer specifically <laughs> about him attending live sex shows in the 70s. Yeah. <laughs> and he, he'll he answer anything, and he's very, very honest, not only about himself, but about his writing. Um, so, you know, in even very specific questions, I, I asked him about the plastics line from The Graduate. Um, he could have made up some story about how it was meant to be all along, but he said, you know, any, it, that word could have been anything. Um, it's just a word that I stuck in there because a professor of mine used to use it all the time, and it just happened to hit and he said you know I, it was one of those things that you couldn't have predicted it and I couldn't have predicted it looking back but it uh, it worked out well and um, another one that I really enjoyed was uh, Dan Mazur who uh, took us into the mind of uh, Sasha Baron Cohen who is co-creator as it turns out and, and of course the star of Borat and Bruno and Daly G Show among other things how did you uh, how did you arrange that and, and talk about trust issue you don't I can't remember ever reading anything that, that Mazur had to say before, or and you certainly you don't see interviews with Sasha. How did you develop the trust to go in and, and have the, that conversation? That was something. Oh, thanks. Well, that was a case of just, you know, I interviewed 40 people, 21 made the final cut, and that was just a case with Dan Mazur of uh, me clicking with them. It was just, you know, immediately I thought, oh, this is someone I can talk to for hours and hours about comedy. And I noticed that with the Brits that I interviewed, also Stephen Merchant, uh, the co-creator of The Office, the British version, their knowledge of American humor is better than our knowledge. I mean, it's just mm-hmm. almost like they're students of comedy, uh, American comedy going back to the silence. They just know a tremendous amount about it. And someone like Dan Mazur is uh, he's just a great guy to talk with, but he's incredibly knowledgeable about uh, comedy, and he, he will he's willing to talk about it for hours, and it's just one of those, I had to cut a lot out of that interview, but it was just, it was a great time for me just to sit there and talk with him about not only the specifics about the uh, Sasha Baron Cohen's characters, but just about comedy in general. Now, uh, it, you know, you you mentioned the, twice now about having to cut these, obviously they're, they're long, but interestingly, with the web... You know, one way I would think to, to get people to buy the book is that you could take some of these outtakes, some of the stuff that clearly you wouldn't have enough space, and, you know, put them up on, 
uh, your website, uh, which I will mention is andheresthekicker.com. Uh, is there any chance that that will happen or that has happened? Well, I have put up four interviews that were cut from the book, uh, whole interviews, on that website, andheresthekicker.com. So the entire interview is there for you, the long versions. But I would like to um, publish a Kindle version, and I would like to publish the full interviews within that version. And I think hopefully, you know, one day, if this book does okay, I'd like to have another version come out that consists of more interviews and longer versions of the interviews. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm hoping that'll happen. Yeah, this is a great example of, and uh, most of the print publishers, they, they don't get this yet, at least in my experience, the ones I'm dealing with, uh, is that, you know, print, obviously, the, the, the news hole is shrinking, whether it's magazines or books. But the web, I mean, everybody's storefront is... It can be the size of Walmart's, and you right. know you can go in there and and read um, so much. And I'm on the website now. I didn't get to look at it before. Oh, Bruce J. Friedman, uh, Daniel Close, the uh, graphic novelist, uh, Ross Chest, cartoonist. That's right for the New Yorker. Right. Yeah. And then Daniel Handler. I I don't know his. He uh, is a Lemony Snicket. Uh, oh. Yeah. Wow. So I wanted to interview one. Right, or at least one writer who dealt with humor uh, for kids and how mm -hmm. they uh, came about it, how they came about their style, and how they dealt with that. Um, so, and he was a really interesting guy. Um, he he has a he's written for adults as well, you know, humor for adults, but uh, he's most popularly known as Lemony Snicket. Hmm. Um, but it, it is true about. Uh, are you saying that publishers don't know about humor or just the uh, potential of uh, of extra uh, text. Extra material, yeah. I, I, right, I think that's the case, and I don't really think they care unless unless they see money from it. Yeah. You know, they don't care what I do on my website, but if, uh, if if it doesn't bring them any money, if it doesn't bring the book any money, they just couldn't care less. And it's all yeah, the bottom just, line. I think they're short-sighted. I mean, again, let's go back to Writer's Digest Press for a minute. You would think, okay, here's a group. Now, I'll, I'll, I'm saying this, just, just so anyone from Writer's Digest Press who's listening, it's, it's me, Mr. Media, saying this, not, uh, not Mike Sachs. But you would think that a, a publisher that is supposedly tuned into what's happening with writers and the changing market and everything would think, okay, we're publishing this book by Mike Sachs, and it has 21 interviews, but he's got more interviews that we don't have room for, and he's got longer interviews. So let's put them on our publisher's website, make people come to the site, they can read these, and they'll... You know, it's kind of like heroin. We'll give them a little taste. They're going to have to want more. They're going to want to buy the book, but they don't do it. It's crazy. I, I agree. It's um, it doesn't really make sense to me. Um, it, it's it's there. It's done. You know, everything is completed, and uh, it's not necessarily being uh, you. I mean, I'm trying to do it, but I'm I'm also pushing for an electronic version. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, uh, I don't think it's going to happen for a while. I would like for it to come out right now. So yeah. if you want to read longer versions or versions that are in, uh, interviews that aren't in the book, you can do so immediately. I think you can have that. You can have someone buying the hard copy and someone buying the electronic version to go with it. Uh, funny you mentioned that because I, I was talking to my, my own agent this morning and uh, I mentioned that you and I were going to talk and he wasn't familiar with the book. So he went, he pulled out his Kindle and he went to see if, to, he was going to order it on Kindle. Yeah. He said, well, the first thing you can tell Mike he needs to get it on the Kindle. He said, because that's, that's where I'm buying all my books now. <laughs> yeah, no, I think uh, he's right. I think um, I, I just don't understand it. And it's, you make more money off a of Kindle. There's nothing, there's no overhead. There's no print and mm -hmm. there's no paper. It just goes straight out. It's all net. So I don't know what, I don't know why there's reluctance on anyone's part to do that. But, you know, we, it, we were talking before about publishers yeah. not understanding. And I think... They, they, a lot of publishers or editors don't really have the same sensibility when it comes to humor that we might have. Um, it seems that a lot of the people that I interviewed weren't, uh, you know, the editors weren't familiar with these writers. I had carte blanche. I, I could pick out whomever I wanted, but the names really didn't mean much to those that I tried to uh, sell the book to. In fact, I tried to, um, you, know, you know, as I said for years, I tried to get the book out there, and I thought these names would be impressive to various people, but it seems that uh, it's just, you know, the sensibility is different. Mm. It, it, it may be that there's not a lot of us that will recognize the names of the authors, and maybe if, if instead of the authors they had listed 
the programs and the and the films that they're, and and you know things that they're associated with uh, that that might have you know I mean certainly if you know Dave Barry you know Dave Barry. But, well, that was the one they were most excited. I did put, but yeah. where the people wrote for it. But I think they just saw it as dollar signs. Can these names and these TV shows, these movies that these people are associated with, can this sell in an airport bookstore? And I, I think right. they felt that they couldn't. So you know, they passed. Well, well, let's come back to talking about what is in the book because I want to help you sell some of these. Um, <laughs> because frankly, I could go on talking and complaining about uh, publishers. Probably all week, and I would never get tired, and I would not run out of stories. But, but I will say this: I mean, thank goodness for Writer's Digest because no one else wanted it, and if it wasn't for them, it wouldn't be out at all. So I have that. I do have to thank them for that. There you go. And you can you can always work. Once the book is out, you can work around them. Well, yeah, I've been doing that from the beginning. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, um, uh, some of the other choices uh, in the books are re- that really do add variety. We're kind of talking about this. Uh, cartoonist Al Jaffe, who's known for Mad Magazine, and who I had on here for about an, for an hour um, uh, not long ago. Great, uh, great interview. He's, he's an older fellow, but uh, mind is so sharp. Oh, yeah, he's incredible. What, what kind of things did you find out about, about his, the way he creates and, and thinks that might be different than you know, the way uh, a Dan Mazur or, or Meryl Marco works? Well, I don't think it's it's a matter of um, creativity. I think it's a matter of what he was allowed to get away with for many years, which <laughs> wasn't much. I mean, he had, he had to work within some pretty solid parameters that Dan Mazur doesn't have to work within. But from what I, you know, I talked to some of these older guys, Irv Brecker, who wrote for the Marx Brothers, and Larry Gelbart, who wrote for MASH and Tootsie and your show of shows. They almost preferred having some sort of parameters because when you work within them, you can om- you find things to do that are more creative that you might not have thought of otherwise if you could use a you know a dirty word or a blue story or whatever. So they liked working within that. I asked Irv Brecker, what would you do differently today if you were starting out than you would have in the 1930s? He said, well, you know, there is a lot more freedom. I could make jokes about whatever. I can talk about whatever. I could talk about abortion if I wanted to, which was absolutely <laughs> forbidden for years and years. He couldn't even use the word damn when he wrote certain jokes. But he said he liked, uh, he liked that. It was, a, it was a challenge, and it made him think uh, differently and, and uh, more creatively. And what about uh, Meryl Marco, uh, who for a long time was, uh, you know, I think under, underwritten or underappreciated because she was a head writer for uh, Letterman's uh, NBC shows for a long time, and also dated the star, and I think some people, you know, didn't give her enough credit for that. Right, but within the industry, she's very well known for being incredibly influential. I think, or I know, Late Night with David Letterman influenced an entire generation of writers, certainly the early writers, contributors to The Onion. That sensibility is hugely influential, and a lot of that came from Meryl Marco. She's a great, great writer, uh, not only of TV, but she later went into writing great books, very funny mm-hmm. books. But she's one of those people that, I, I, you know, this, this is an example of one of those people who publishers may not be aware of, but if you are familiar with humor, you really should be familiar with her because she was uh, incredibly talented and a huge influence. Um, someone you had in here is um, uh, Todd Hansen uh, from The Onion. Um, the Onion's interesting to me in that while you can get it online, most people know it if they have it in their city, if, if there's a print edition. And their brand of humor is very different, I think, from almost anyone else. Well, absolutely, but I don't know about that. I mean, I, I think that's, that, that's a case of a type of humor that's amazing, yet has gone mainstream, which is incredibly rare. I mean, I find people everywhere knows, knows what the onion is now, uh, whereas hmm. for many years... They were sort of underground until they went onto the web. But I, I do think that because the stories are so easily to, easily forwarded now, you can just click a link and forward it on, I do think it's become much, much better known. And they have a huge, absolutely huge readership online. It's in the millions. And how does he explain their brand of humor? I mean, that... Um, well, he was a huge, he's a huge fan of Merle Marco, and they're hmm. actually good friends. And he's, he came right out and said, you know, if Meryl Marco was my number one 
influence. I mean, she was, her sensibility captured it all for me and my generation. We we grew up and we started, he said, talking like Letterman, uh, telling jokes like Letterman. It was such a strong style of comedy. People uh, sort of slipped into it. You know, it was easy to uh, try to emulate. And he said that not, it, it was a huge influence not only on him, but on the entire Onion staff and for other shows as well. I mean, you see it with uh, other talk shows to this day, some uh, these hosts try to capture that sensibility, which is extremely difficult. Mm. You know, I, this question just crossed my mind as, we, as you were talking about that. Are you a funny guy? I mean, do you think of yourself, I mean, can you write humor, or do you just have this appreciation for people who do? What? Well, um, yeah, I do. I do publish humor for uh, Esquire and Vanity Fair and Radar when it was around and a few mm. pieces in The New Yorker. But I didn't feel that that was my role with this book, and I'm just happy. If if the reader doesn't know that I'm involved with humor, I'm just fine with that. One of my pet peeves is reading interviews with funny people where the interviewer tries to outdo the interviewee, um, almost like it's a competition. But I, that wasn't really my role. My role here was just to bring out uh, you know the best of the of the interviewees and not hmm. necessarily mention my own past. Interestingly, there, uh, I think of someone like, uh, when you said that, uh, immediately my my mind went to Esquire, and I, I thought of uh, A.J. Jacobs as someone who is as funny as most people that he writes about, but then there's someone else there whose name I will not mention who tries real hard to be funnier than the person he's writing about, yeah. and it just never works. So well, there yeah, are a few I, people. A.J. Jacobs is a major talent. He's fantastic. He can write anything, really, and uh, serious and non-serious but there, there's, there's a, there are a few people who can do that at the top level. Uh, mm-hmm. Calvin Trillin was one of them. But uh, to, to be, you know, it's such a specific talent, uh, writing humor. A lot of people who can write funny can't necessarily write at the top level uh, journalistically and vice and, versa. And, and not to talk too much about a magazine that is not Vanity Fair, but I have to ask you, since I, I started us on this path, um, did you read Cal Fussman's uh, profile this month of... Uh, 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 Gerard Butler? No. Oh, God. <laughs> this is this is not a case of someone who's trying to be funny, to yeah. be funnier than who he's writing about. It's just, I, I recommend it to you and anybody listening to this. I, I, I actually read it. I've never done this. I read this out loud to my wife while she was in the kitchen. I just, it was just so unintentionally hysterical. Where was this? What, what publication? Uh, it's, the cover of es- it's the cover of Esquire this month. Oh, okay. So Gerard. So, oh, I know what that is. That's right. It's a funny premise, but I did not read it. Yeah. Yeah. It's. Yeah. It's. Yeah. It. You know, it doesn't work at every moment in the, uh, but it's very damn funny. And I, 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 so you you know the premise. I'll tell people. It, right, it, right. 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 He was Cal Fussman's a writer for Esquire, and basically he's not a very hip guy. He doesn't know a lot about pop culture. He's been relocated, I guess, out to Hollywood, and he's he's trying real hard. But uh, so they gave him the guy's first name they said you're going to go interview a guy named Jerry and here's his address and that's all they told him and he had to figure out what the guy does for a living and it's just it's you know as magazine pieces go it's so hard to be original these days and come up with that new that it was very funny so. well yeah it's hard to be original but he wasn't even he didn't even know he was being original right I mean, <laughs> true true absolutely only the true. editors knew that it's a very absolutely. clever premise I've never seen that before it's almost kind of cruel in a sense but Good for him for uh, going along with it. Well, and and, and the, the butler went along with it. Was was the part that was just fascinating. Yeah, right. Read. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, let's come back to uh, to your work. Who was the uh, who was the toughest get for the book? To use the uh, talk show term. Um, well, the toughest gets were those who just refused, and there was plenty. Uh, for some reason, a lot of female writers refused. I talked or I sent out request to at least 15 top female writers and either they didn't get back or they said no which I found odd Um, Hmm. I'm not sure if it was a lack of ego or that there's so few top female humor writers that they're being asked so often they just don't want to give too many interviews but there was no really tough get Uh, everyone who did participate was pretty easy to um, convince once I got their contact info Hmm. But a tough one was Davis Sedaris only because he has no email and he lives in France. So that took a while, but he was incredibly gracious with his time once he did receive the, uh, the query. 
Well, the, the, women, it, the, the case of the women is very interesting because, you know, uh, uh, of course, I started by saying there was one. There, there's two in the book. And uh, so what, what you're saying is it's not because, you know, you couldn't find them. They just didn't want to be, they didn't want to participate. Isn't that odd? I mean, they, they usually, yeah, I know. they complain that they don't get the attention. Well, it, it is odd, and I, I just know that I'm going to get criticism for for having it uh, male-heavy rather than women, and I really, really didn't want it to be a men's club. I really did want it to be even with men and women. I just I do not know why uh, they didn't want to participate. I really don't. I just don't understand it. But maybe if there's a second volume, I can concentrate more on that if they're willing to do it at that point. Was... Uh put you on the spot. Was Liz Winstead one of the ones who said no? Uh, Liz Winstead was one of the ones I was going to ask. I did not ask her. It's a, ah. The original writer for The Daily Show, correct? Right. And creator, I think. Uh, for the original version, not, not yeah. John Stewart. Not for the current version, right. Right. No, I did, not, I did not end up asking her. But, I mean, there's a whole list I could go down, just, uh, starting from Tina Fey on down, that I just begged, practically, I begged Tina Fey for over a year. And, uh, you know, obviously she's busy, but, uh, and she didn't know who I was, and I can't really blame her, really, but I would have loved to have chatted with her. Hmm. Um, on the male side, uh, uh, or, well, even the female, well, you mentioned Tina Fey, so I'm going to guess that Tina was probably the, the biggest that you tried and could not get. What about overall? Who, who did you, you know, were you pulling strings? Were you asking friends of friends? And... Yeah, in a lot of cases I was. I mean, there were quite a few men who didn't want to be interviewed either, Steve Martin, Albert Brooks, uh, on down the line. But, uh, you know, Woody Allen. Yeah, but I think these are cases of, they're asked so often, they give so many interviews, that the thought of giving a five-hour interview was not that appealing to them. And, you know, quite frankly, they don't really need it in this part of their careers. Steve Martin... I think it's the last thing he needs is to talk to me for five hours about comedy. He just doesn't need to do it. I would have loved to have done it, but just it's not going to happen. Well, of course, in, in Martin's uh, defense, I would say that having read his, his book, uh, Born Standing Up, I think that's the title, um, right. he really went into uh, – I was uh, amazed at the detail he went into uh, on how over the years he's created jokes and, and uh, um, developed his uh, persona uh, as Steve Martin. It was fascinating. I love that book. Um, that was he almost approached yeah. it as in a scientific way, and it's not easy talking about humor, especially when it's your own. But he really pulled it off. It was beautifully written. It was fantastic. Yeah. And who's going to come after him and try to explain Steve Martin better than he explained himself? Right. You can't do it. I think that may be one of the reasons why he did do that, because no one understands himself or his humor better than he does. It was. Uh, it was it, that was great, and that uh, I, I remember being in high school. Uh, the week that he did King Tut on Saturday Night Live, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and we just the, the girl and I, the, the girl I was seeing, we just happened to have tickets to see him. Like I don't know if it was three or three days later at uh, the uh, uh, the Rutgers uh, Fieldhouse, brand new. I think it was the first concert event that was at the Rutgers Fieldhouse in New Brunswick, uh, New Jersey, and uh, it was the first place that he performed King Tut live outside of Saturday Night Live. And he, he, I, I'm trying to remember if he referenced that. I knew he talked about. That weekend at, at at SNL, and I just you know when I read that it was I, I I was completely sold when I got to that point. If I wasn't already, because I was fascinated by how that all came about. It was so different. It is it's incredibly different. Well, how was what what was the audience's reaction just a few days after the initial broadcast? Oh uh, well, you know he was already so huge. Everybody was just nuts. I I, I didn't hear screaming like that again for uh, like it I don't know it must have been uh, seven or eight years later when I I had to cover uh, Duran Duran. Uh, and it was, you know, that was just nothing but, the, but women and girls screaming their heads off. It was pretty similar. I mean, it was just, it was like the Beatles seeing Steve Martin uh, three days after he did that SNL. I mean, he was already the wild and crazy guy. He had already, did, you know, did people know the lyrics to King Tut already. Um, three days later, that's a good question. It exploded. They weren't that complicated, so I want to say maybe. Right, it wasn't exactly up there with uh, Strawberry Fields Forever, I guess. But right, and, it was such and, a new the, thing. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it was. Uh, I don't think it had been released yet. But I know they released it awfully quickly after that. Well, every but, practically every writer I interviewed mentions Steve Martin as a major influence, and even 
going back to his very early career, to his first book, which was very, very influential. It's called Cruel Shoes. Sure, I've got it. Yeah, and you can see that sensibility in McSweeney's and other online humor magazines today. This was, and this was done over 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, very, uh, you can pick it up used, and I recommend you. T- it's a very interesting book where someone who was selling out major stadiums would release a book like that. He could have very easily sold out and just republished his stand-up, but he didn't. He went in a completely different direction. And I think he uh, puzzled. A lot of readers were really puzzled by it. And they still m- may be puzzled by it today. I don't know. <laughs> probably probably right. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's funny. I, um, I heard on uh, – I, like I like to listen to um, Howard Stern on Sirius, but also sometimes I'll switch over if I've already heard the show or it's a repeat to um, one of the comedy channels. And on the Blue Collar channel the other day, I heard a guy – I thought to myself, oh, my God, is there Steve Martin material that I haven't heard? It's a guy named uh, James P. Connolly, Jim Connolly. Mm-hmm. I swear he's doing Steve Martin's act, and he's doing it really well. Well, and what, but what's his character? Does he, does he take on that character that Steve Martin took on? He, he does in, in the sense that he's kind of like playing the idiot, mm-hmm. but it's himself, but he's playing the idiot, and... He does. It's just the, the way he spoke. My wife normally will not sit and listen to this stuff with me. You know, she's just like, "Oh, you're such an idiot." But you know, I said, "You got to hear this guy," <laughs> and it was just like she's laughing. And I thought, "Yeah, he's got something there." It's a little Steve. It's a lot Steve Martin. But you know, Steve Martin isn't doing Steve Martin these days, so there well, may be an thing. opportunity there. That's yeah. really interesting because to to do a Steve Martin is not easy, and I think he may have been one of the few major comedians whose jokes were never really stolen because you just couldn't do it. It was only nah. Steve Martin who could do it. But that sensibility was very, very influential. And it, it, you can see it on a lot of today's writers and performers. Well, if anyone's interested, you can check this guy out. It's James P. Connolly, C-O-N-N... Oh, I can't remember if it's O-L-L-Y or E-L-L-Y, but either way, you'll find it. And it's .TV. That's the catch, .TV. Um... Well, let's change gears a little bit before we wrap up. Tell me about uh, your work at Vanity Fair. Uh, do, you, do you have a, uh, a beat, per se, or a particular field? Uh, how do assignments work at the magazine? Well, I'm not, I'm not a uh, full-time writer. I'm on the editorial staff. Ah. But, you know, the contributing editors are the writers, and the way it works is that they um, either are given assignments by an editor who uh, feels that this would be good for the readership, or they pitch uh, five ideas or so and maybe get one chosen and then they go out and write it. And there's no, um, you know, just because a writer writes something for Vanity Fair doesn't mean it's going to get in. In fact, there's right. a good chance that it won't. There's a lot of competition. But I do write for other magazines, um, mostly humor, and uh, I just sold a book last week to Broadway Books, which will be out next summer. Uh, it's a parody on a sex manual. That I'm co-writing it with friends from The Tonight Show and Daily Show and The Onion. Oh, cool! Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Don't 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 get don't let the word get around that there are still publishers buying books because of you know it'll spoil it for the rest of us. Our little secret. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's true. No one's buying anything, but I don't know how this one managed to uh, squeak on by. Mm. So uh, you'd like to do uh, a second kicker book or something along those lines? I would like to extend it. I mean, my. I would like it just to make it huge, and the, I would want it to be the one go-to book for this sort of thing. You know, I'm, I'm really happy with how it turned out. It's just with my OCD, I have to get everything in there. <laughs> if it's not, I get anxious. So, um, in a perfect world, I would uh, expand it with uh, longer interviews and with additional interviews. And you know, maybe now that this book is out, uh, those some of the writers that I wanted to interview would be more willing to sit down and talk. Which I love, I'd love to do. Hmm. Somehow I don't think Writer's Digest Press is going to do the second book. I think you'll have to find someone else, though. Well, that's... Uh, <laughs> now that we've run them down. It's <laughs> <laughs> fine with me, I guess. If yeah. anyone out there is listening is interested, please contact me. <laughs> well, uh, listen, folks, you can find Mike Sachs' wonderful uh, interview collection. Uh, and here's the kicker. Conversations with 21 top humor writers on their craft. I personally recommend it. It's a wonderful book. I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying the hell out of reading it. It's, uh, it's probably, now it, you know, we've been running down the publishers, so who knows. I'm going to say it's in great bookstores everywhere, but you Actually, may do yeah. better. 
to find it online. Uh, it'll be um, available on mrmedia.com, and uh, it's available at amazon.com. You can also, <coughs> pardon me, you can learn more about Mike and uh, his book at either mikesacks.com, that's M-I-K-E-S-A-C-K-S.com, or and here's the kicker.com. Uh, either one of those, you'd be able to find out, find uh, information about the book. And so, and uh, Mike, it's a great book. I, I, I look forward. To, I, I hope you get to do a second one, and uh, I, I will definitely be uh, online waiting to read it. Thanks so much. It was really fun. You're a very, very good reviewer, uh, interviewer, I should say. Not, not a good reviewer. I know you'll take that review, right? <laughs> I'll take it as far as it can go, my friend. But yeah, I had a good time. I appreciate you having me on. Thanks. Uh, thanks for being here, and uh, continued good luck with it. All right. Thanks so much. All right. Take care. All right. Take care, Bob. Bye-bye. Bye. And folks, for uh, more interviews with your favorite uh, journalists and uh, authors, you can surf over to our main website, www.mrmedia.com. That's where you can listen to my earlier conversations with A.J. Jacobs of Esquire, John Darton of the New York Times, 2009 Pulitzer Prize winner for features, Lane DeGregory, and many more. And please think about writing an online review of Mr. Media, casting a vote for Mr. Media, or marking Mr. Media as one of your favorites. Whether you listen on Blog Talk Radio, True Slant, uh, Digital Journal, Vox, Podcast Pickle, Mediafly, Podfeed.net, Blueberry, Zencast, Symbio, or Odeo. Subscribe to Mr. Media on iTunes and you'll never miss a show. Just search Mr. Media Interviews from within iTunes and subscribe for free. Or subscribe to Mr. Media's blog on the Amazon Kindle Reader. You can also listen with a piece of string and a tin can in many locations. If you've got an idea for a guest, email me directly at bob at andelman.com. That's A-N-D-E-L-M-A-N dot com. You can also follow me on Facebook or on Twitter, www.twitter.com. Thanks so much for joining us today. Always appreciate when you give up a piece of your day and spend it with us.